Um, I want us to pray. Thank you all for being here. I know it's been a long week and uh, pretty good crowd. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things I just want to say is um, what you're going to hear today, um, we have not perfected. Can you agree with that, Brother Mike? Um, but I do believe there are principles that um, will help you be a, a better Bible student and studying, and um, I do believe expositional preaching is the only way to preach, because I do believe that's the only way to, to say what God says. Does that make sense? And so, uh, I want us to pray, and uh, then we're going to, I'm going to do just a, about a five or six minute intro, and then the bishop, elder, presbyteros, pope cardinal, Mike Tester is going to stand up here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to give you guys some time to ask questions, okay? It's not just going to be y'all scribbling a bunch of stuff down. And hopefully we'll have some time before 12 if you're going to be able to endure. Just let you guys just pick a scripture and let's just walk through it, okay, and how, how to study. Uh, we're not here to tell you how to build a sermon, although that it will probably come out. Uh, but most importantly, just how to study, Okay. So, with that being said, let's, uh, let's pray, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Kyle to pray for us, if you don't mind, Brother. Well, all right, guys, let me uh, first say this. Um, there's a lot of folks in the world today who have named themselves as expositors, and they're not, they're not expositors, okay? Just because you go verse by verse, line by line, word by word does not make you an expositor or even studying exposition. But I do believe the Spirit of God wrote it in order, in sequence, and uh, if that's the way he wrote it, that's the way we need to read it, right? You do not, if I was to write you a letter, you wouldn't pick up in the middle of the letter and start trying to figure out what I said at the beginning. So what would you do? You start out at the beginning. As a matter of fact, if I wrote you a letter, you, on the outside of the envelope, what are you looking at? The address and who it's from, right? So that you kind of halfway know some common ground. Y'all got me? So with that being said, uh, I, I want to give you three circles here that I do that do consistently. Brother Mike seen me do this, and many of you guys have seen it. But usually what happens is there's three circles that go in a, in a verse, and here's what normally happens. We normally deal with what, we, what I call the implied truth. For example, most people, and I'm not going to, I, I don't want you to throw some of your resources away, but one of the worst things that's happened in America is uh, a knave's topical bomb. Because a knave's topical Bible. Because what that does is it takes a word, it's like a dictionary, and you flip open to the knaves, and it gives you every verse that that word's used. Well, but that verse may not be in context, right? So it may be a different, it may be a different um, application. Is that, is that a good word, Brother Mike? Okay. Now don't throw them away. I have a knave's topical Bible, okay? Um, but it, it will help you kind of get those words and, and cross-reference them. So there's an implied truth. For example, all right, um, you would look up a topic, maybe the love of God, all right? And so you'll look at those verses, and most folks would say that John 3.16 is about the love of God. Brother Mike, would you agree with that? Brother Mike said yes, but it's not. In other words, he agreed with most people would say that it's about the love of God. John 3.16 is really about judgment, Okay. And so contextually, you got to understand that. Now, 
the society has told us that there's an implied truth because it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so there's an implied truth because they took one word out and began to build a thought process out of that. Does that make sense? And so you're going to hear constantly, and I know y'all do, about context. The next thing is an essential truth. Is the love of God essential? The answer is yes. Right? But then when you get to the core truth, it's not that the love of God is an implied truth and a central truth. Now you, what you got to do is you got to understand the God of love. And so your text deals with who is the subject in every text in the Bible? Jesus, God, right? So why is it that we hear stuff like this? Be a David. You can't be David because David couldn't be David if Jesus wasn't in David. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? Does that make sense? And so there's a lot of implied and essential truths that will stir our hearts and stir our emotions, but only the core truth is going to deal with your will. Only God can change the will of man. Can we agree with that? So let's get to the core truth. Y'all with me? So that being said, why do we do this? Why, why, why should we be about understanding these things because Paul did it Paul dealt with implied truths but he always got to the core truth sometimes Paul would start with the core truth and go out to the implied truth okay they're implied and essential is you need those things but you've got to keep it tied to the God of love does that make sense if I'm, if I'm preaching on the love of God I've got to get to the God of love y'all we good I know brother Kyle's like he hears us all the time all right Y'all got it? So, what is our approach? See, one of the things is, is we do not pr approach the word correctly. And so, I want you to turn to Acts 20. And I just want to kind of walk through why we are to do um, why, why are we to not only teach and preach, but study contextually. Somebody read verse 20 of Acts 20, verse 20. Okay. What, what, what is, what's going on there? What's being taught? In those, verse 20, what's verse 19 say? What do we got to declare? Mike Boston, what do you got to declare? If you're teaching Sunday school, what, what do you need to declare? Okay. So we got to know what that is, right? So how we approach the Word of God is very important in how we study. Now, you, there's a lot of things that we're going to cover, but I'm going to let Brother Mike walk you through phrase by phrase how to study. Now, we go word by word. Really, in context, phrase by phrase is very important. Okay? Now, how many of y'all would agree? That's 747 taking off. You good? How many of y'all would agree, would agree that uh, what Paul says does not contradict what Peter says? How many of y'all would agree what Jesus says doesn't disagree or conflict with what Paul says? Because Paul was always saying what Jesus said. Let me go a little step further. How many of you guys realize that what the Old Testament says does not contradict what the New Testament says? So there's there's pointers that I'm going to give you after Brother Mike kind of walks through this. Uh, and I want to give him all the time. I do. Y'all hear me all the time. But there are some pointers that I can give you as you're studying for these flags that you need to be looking, to, looking for to help you understand kind of the context of the passage. Does that make sense? Brother Mike, you ready? Y'all ready to hear the bishop? Come on, brother, get up here. Well, it, uh, just what I want to do this, this morning, I'm just going to take just a few minutes. But I want to, because uh, I don't want to preach something, I just want to show you how I study, okay? 
because a lot of times what helped me to learn was to learn how other people were saved. And so what I want to do is kind of walk you through a, a little passage to show you how I study. Now, I want to make a few statements first, okay, just kind of to go off of what Brother Brad has already said. One of the misnomers about expository study, and, and listen, there's expository teaching, expository preaching, and expository study. And so if you don't know how to study expositorily, you're not going to be able to be teach expositorily, and you're not going to be able to preach expositorily. So, you know, so, so for every one of us in here, we're all to be Bereans. We're all to be studiers. And so to learn how to study in an expository way is the beginning of everything. So if you teach a Sunday school class and you want to teach expositorily, if you don't know how to study expositorily, you, you're not going to be able to teach expository. Does that make sense? And so it's more than just a style of teaching or preaching. It, it's, it's literally, it's, it's the heartbeat of how to study. Now, one of the misnomers about expository studying or preaching or teaching is where you take a passage and you get a general theme of the passage. In other words, like I could read a section of verses, and that section of verses could deal with a, a, a theme, okay? And then I take that theme, and then I just deal with that theme that's in that passage, and then I say that's expository preaching. That's it's not expository preaching. Expository preaching is, is even more than verse by verse. Now, what I was taught all my life is it's verse by verse, and it is, but it's more than that. It's phrase by phrase. Because every phrase, if, you, if you're really careful, every phrase can have very in-depth meaning. Now, I'll give you an example of what I was talking about. Talking about. So how many of y'all were here last night? All right, so what I did last night, because of time, was only half of that message. Now, you say, what do you mean? There was so much in those phrases that, you know, when I... When I preached that message at my church, I, I, it was, you know, almost 50 minutes. So, so there's, there's so much information in phrases. And if you know how to ask and ask, answer the right questions, and that's the key to studying phrase by phrase. You've got to know what questions to ask and then where to find the answer. And so your, your greatest gift when you study is to know what the right question to ask is. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to take and just show you a little passage, and I'm just going to show you what I do, you know, the process I go through, or at least an abbreviated form of it, uh, when I take a passage and, and begin to study it. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, okay, and I, I'm just going to look, just kind of walk you through just a few verses here, just to give you the idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, but this is an example where a lot of times you'll see these phrases and you'll just, you'll just read over them. And you'll say, well, that's, you know, that's, that's interesting. And you'll just read over them because you're, you don't take time to just ask the simple little questions. And these simple little questions can absolutely change what you get out of a passage. You know, a lot of it, I could put it this way. A lot of it is, are you after the milk of the word or are you after the meat of the word? And so, can I tell you, to get the meat of the word, you have to do some work. I mean, it, it takes diligence. It, it really does. And so, so look at this with me. I, first, I want to just kind of read these first five verses, and then I'm just going to show you what I do and how I study, okay? Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did eat of the same spiritual meat, and did drink of the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock is what? Y'all with me? Now, what if I told you that the rock in what I just read is not the only reference to Christ? What if I told you that each of these phrases are a reference to Christ? You see, this is what I'm talking about. You have to develop a mindset to study phrase by phrase. So, so here's the way I do this. So I look here, moreover, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant. Now, if I see that word, not have you to be ignorant, 
how many of you agree my antenna ought to go up? Because he's exhorting me not to be unlearned or not knowing about whatever he's about to share. So if I see, don't be ignorant about this. I mean, my antenna ought to go up right there and say, whoa, Nelly, I need to know exactly what he's saying. Not in general, but in detail. Because again, he's going to start and every little phrase is magnified and important. And so that word, not be ignorant, ought to first make my antenna go up. And say, all right, I've got to be very diligent here. I've got to be very careful here that I understand what's going on. All right, so now look at these phrases. And I want to show you how important these little phrases are. And many times these are phrases you'll just read by. Knowing that our fathers were under the cloud. Now the phrase I want you to look at is under the cloud. Now, we would look at that and say, well, you know, it just means that, you know, cloud by day. And I know what that means. And so... So I go on. Well, it's much, much more than that. So if I see that word under the cloud, and I've already read, don't be ignorant about this stuff. What's my first question I'm going to ask concerning that phrase under the cloud? Y'all tell me. What cloud? What else? It, it can be multiple questions. What else? Huh? When? What? Where? Where? What does this mean? Huh? Exactly. So when you when you see a phrase like that, and he is exhorting us, don't be ignorant about this, then yes, every one of your questions, I guarantee in your mind you were thinking of the Old Testament, right? So so you go back to the Old Testament and you find out when you study this in the Old Testament that it's rich in meaning. It's much more than just them walking under a cloud. There was meaning to it. There was a purpose in it. There was a purpose in why God gave them that cloud. And why he gave them that cloud is the thrust of what he's saying. Don't be ignorant about this. Because it's important. So if you go back, now I'm not, just real quickly, I'll just cheat for you. Can I cheat for you for time's sake? All right, so, so what does the cloud mean? Well, Exodus 13, 21. And the Lord went before them by a day, a pillar of cloud, to lead them in the way by night, a pillar of fire, to give them light to go by day and night. All right, so what was the purpose of the cloud? It was to what? Lead, guide, right? So in other words, the cloud for them was revelation. They didn't know where to go, how to go without the cloud. You know, a lot of people think when the children of Israel in the wilderness, they just went and walked around the place. No. God directed them every step. And so for the cloud, for them, was what? Revelation. It was the direction of God. It was the leading of God. Well, can I ask you a question? By who do we have revelation? The Spirit of Christ, right? And so again, you get back to this core truth. And so he's writing to these New Testament believers that in essence on a historical basis it would mean nothing concerning Israel and them having a cloud I don't have a cloud, what's it matter to me but what he's trying to say is this cloud meant so much more it was a picture of what you and I have in Christ alright but what if I told you the cloud meant more than just that you say what do you mean well let me give you another verse out of the Old Testament okay Exodus 14, this is when Israel was up against the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army was coming down against them, okay? And it, so that's the backdrop of it. He says, and the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Now, what is that talking about? So if, if leading them and guiding them, which is the first thing we looked at, is revelation. So what would it mean when... The pillar of cloud, Israel's at the edge of the Red Sea. Y'all remember what happened. They're, they they want to kill Moses. They think he's the worst preacher it ever was. And the Pharaoh's army's coming against them, and they're coming and complaining. They're going, would to God we'd go back to Egypt because you brought us out here to kill us. Y'all remember all that? All right, so Pharaoh's army's coming against them. They can't go right. They can't go left. They can't go forward. And the army's behind them. 
So what does God do? He takes that same cloud and he goes behind them between them and Pharaoh's army. Our protection. So, in other words, who's your protection? If God be for you, who can be? All right, so, so here's the thing. So this cloud means much more than just, well, they walked under a cloud. Big deal. You see, it pictures something for you and I. So why would he say, don't be ignorant of this? Because you, he wanted you to understand that, and here's... Here's the essence of this little passage. It's talking about the privileges in which Israel had. So they had the privilege of revelation. They knew where to go. They knew how to go. They had the privilege of protection. God protected them. How many agree? After the way they acted, God would have had every right to say, I'm not going to protect you at all. But in God's mercy and grace, what did he do? Protected them anyway. So the cloud is picture and protection. The clouds picture and revelation. Christ is, through the spirit of Christ, we have revelation. Through, this, for, through his work, we have protection. I mean, he, listen, all these things are so important to us. So here's what I'm saying to you. The privileges that, that Israel had in a physical cloud, we have even more in the Christ. So how many agree we're privileged folks? Okay? How many agree Israel was privileged folks? Okay? Privileged by grace, yes, but we were privileged, right? All right, so now, go to the next phrase. And all pass through the sea. Now, what sea do you think he's talking about? There's your question. So if I read that, the first question I'm going to ask, what sea? So y'all tell me, what sea? The Red Sea. All right, so if I know it's the Red Sea, then what am I immediately going to do if I want to understand this phrase? Huh? Go look it up. So I'm going to go back to the Old Testament. I'm going to go to the passage on the Red Sea. I'm going to read that passage. I'm going to study that passage. I'm going to find out what that passage says, what it meant. All right, so, so what happened in the Red Sea? All right, so it says they went through. So y'all remember the story. Real quickly, y'all remember the story. So they're up against the Red Sea. The Lord parts the waters. They go across on dry ground. God puts in the heart of Pharaoh to go after him. By the way, Pharaoh didn't choose that himself. God put it in his heart. Now, why did God put it in his heart? Because God was doing more than just protecting Israel. So God put it in his heart to go across after them. Y'all remember what happened? They got in the midst of the Red Sea and the waters came back and it destroyed Pharaoh and all his army. Now you say, why is that important to me? Why shouldn't I be ignorant about that? Because here's the thing. What did it represent for Israel when God destroyed Pharaoh and his army? Huh? Full deliverance. His might, his power in deliverance, right? So, so when Israel got out of Egypt, when God delivered them out of Egyptian bondage, would you agree they were out of the bondage of the physical, but they were still spiritually bound? You say, why were they still spiritually bound? Well, you see it at the Red Sea. When, when they saw Pharaoh's army coming, what did they do? Man, they began to shake. They began to get mad at Moses. You know, you brought us out here to kill us. I mean, what in the world are you doing? Would to God we'd go back to Egypt? I mean, they were not delivered yet. They were delivered physically, but they weren't delivered spiritually. They weren't delivered mentally. They were still in bondage mentally and spiritually. And so how many agree? God didn't deliver you partially. So what did he have to do? Well, he had to remove what still bound them. So... The first phrase, under the cloud, speaks of revelation and protection. Going through the sea speaks of what? Separation. Separation from what? What binds them? Because now Israel's on the other side. They look back and the, the one thing they feared more than God. They see now drowning in the Red Sea. 
How many agree now? They had nothing to be bound by. So when it says God set them free, he set them free indeed. So how many of you agree that if I wouldn't have went and looked that up, I would have just read, went through the sea and said, well, you know, God just helped them to go through the sea. And I wouldn't have understood what it meant. So would you, can I ask you another question? Were they privileged to have revelation? Were they privileged to have protection? Were they privileged to have separation from what mattered? So how many agree they're privileged people? Oh, by the way, didn't Jesus do the same thing for you? This is how I go about it. Okay? Now, I'll show you a couple more, and I'm going to turn it back over to Brad. Because there's another phrase that's really, you think, well, this makes no sense. And they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Huh? It's a great statement. So what does it mean, baptized unto Moses? See, there's my question. Now, you say, well, preacher, how do I go about and find the answer to that? Well, you, here's where you have to do a little more study than just going back to the Old Testament. So the first thing I've got to study is I've got to look up the word baptized, right? When you look it up, here's what it's going to mean. You look it up in the Strong's or whatever Blue Letter Bible, whichever one you use, you look it up, it's going to be I'm immersed in, I'm fully immersed in. That's what it's going to define it as. So what does it mean when he says he immersed them into Moses? Well, it's a picture of identification. He immersed them into Moses. He made them one with Moses. Now, here, here's an amazing truth, and don't lose this. When you were baptized, you got wet. How many of you agree? Everything that's true about that water became true about you when Brad put you under that water. The effects of that water had an effect on you. It's wet. You went under. You're wet. So in Romans 6, we were baptized what? Into Christ Jesus. So everything true about Christ is now what? True about us. So what was it with Moses? Well, Moses, they were identified now as Moses being their lead, their leader, their prophet, their deliverer. And Moses became everything for them by God. Now you say, well, I thought God was everything. He was. But God worked through Moses. Well, the same is true with you and I in Christ. And so we were immersed in the person of the Lord Jesus. Now, then you get to verse 3 and 4, and you find it gets even more. He said they did all eat of the spiritual, same spiritual meat. They did all drink of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was what? Christ. All right, now. So... The first thing I'm going to ask myself when I come to those phrases is I'm going to say, all right, what spiritual meat? What spiritual drink? What rock is he talking about? So I go back to the Old Testament again. When I go back to the Old Testament, I find this in the Old Testament, and I begin to study it, and you, and you, and you find out that all this pictures Christ again. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go through each one of these. I'm going to give you all some homework so you all can do some of this yourself. Amen? But here's, let me deal with the rock part, okay, just real simply. How many agree that the rock, the water that came from the rock began with Israel's murmuring and complaining? Okay? And you all remember what happened. You know, they, they were thirsty, and Moses went to God and said, God, what do you want me to do? I mean, they're, they're thirsty, and I don't know what to do. I mean, I, help me out here. And, and the Lord said, well, go find this rock. And he said, now when you come to the rock, he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take your staff and I want you to what? So when he struck the rock, what happened? Water came out. So the provision that God had for Israel came out through the striking of the rock. What is this, who does it say the rock is? How many agree? He had to be struck on the cross. And then the provision of his life came out. 
Now, Israel had a tradition, okay? And this is what their tradition, this is what they believe from a historical backdrop. They believed that that rock, that physical rock, followed them everywhere they went. That's what they taught. Matter of fact, that's what they still teach today. That they believed that God took that physical rock and it followed them everywhere they went. If you read the rabbinical writings, that's what it's going to tell you. Now, in essence, they did have someone follow them everywhere. But it wasn't a physical rock. It was the Lord. And he was the provision for them everywhere they went. So with all that being said, would you say Israel was greatly privileged? All right, would you say that we're even more so? Because what was physically true for them is spiritually true for us. So now you get to the end of the paragraph. It says, but with many of them, verse 5, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So as privileged as they were, what did they do with it? Did they abandon themselves by faith? No. What happened? Well, they wouldn't trust God to go into the land of Canaan. They believed the rock was following them. They believed God was supernatural to do that. But yet they didn't believe God was enough to go into the land of Canaan. There was giants. There was walled cities. I mean, there's a limit to what God can do, right? I mean, that was their mindset. Now, they wouldn't have said that. But that's really what they were thinking. And so what did God do? After all that I've done for you, after all the privileges of grace that I've given you, and I've manifested toward you, you're not going to trust me to go to Canaan? So what did God do? Well, he removed one generation and brought up another one. So in other words, here's the title, if I was doing this. Privileged, but not pleasing. So if I'm studying this, and I'm doing this phrase by phrase, and I see all these wonderful privileges that I have in Christ Jesus, pictured in in the Old Testament with Israel, my question I'm going to ask myself, just like I ask, what does this mean? I'm going to ask myself, am I living in the reality by faith, of the privileges God gave me by faith. His revelation. His protection. His separation. His provision. That's how I study. Does that make sense? So don't pass over these phrases, guys. I'm telling you. They're rich. They're rich. All right. That's all I got, dude, for right now. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Uh, we, we're we're going to let you guys kind of ask questions in just a few moments. But you understand that when you start studying expositionally, what did that just do to you, Mike Boston? It made you do what? Old Testament study. And most people in today's church doesn't know what the Old Testament says. And what happens is, is we teach kids about the crossing of the Red Sea of Exodus 14, 14. It's just a story, and they just read it, and they move on, and they don't have a clue of what he just did. So what do you do when Jesus says, as in the days of Lot, as it was in the days of Noah? you got to go back and look at it. Okay? Can I make one point real quick, not to preach what Brother Mike said? Go to Exodus 14 right quick. On the Red Sea thing. Somebody read verse 30 and 31. Because could we not say that those that were baptized into Moses, can we not now go to someone who is going to be baptized? We got, I don't know, 10 or 12 that's going to be baptized next time we have baptism. And can we not say that baptism is an identification? Can we not go and say, okay, Matthew 3, Joel, that 
why did Jesus say permit it to be so that righteousness may be fulfilled? And John the Baptist goes, no, you, you ought to be baptizing me. I don't need to be baptizing you. And Jesus goes, no, 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 you, I need to be baptized by you. Why? Because he identified with what John had just said the day before when he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus says, John, if these people are really going to believe that I am the Lamb that slain before the foundation of the world, you baptize me, I'm going to identify with the message that you've preached. So when you get into 1 Corinthians, and I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, and then somebody gets spiritual and goes, well, I'm of Christ. What are they saying? They're identifying through baptism. So now what am I doing? Doctrinally, I'm going to begin to deal with what baptism really is. Is that, is that true? So I'm going to read verse 30 and 31 of Exodus 14. All right, so we can say that verse 31 is a summary, but verse 30 is important because here's what happened. God not only saved them, but he showed them. Did you not, Brother Mac? What did they see? They saw bodies washing up on the bank. And so now there is a security and a certainty. I mean, it's one thing for me to go, hey, Butch, did you hear that all of Pharaoh's army got drowned yesterday? What is that? That's hearsay. But when Butch Fontenot can walk to the beach and see chariots washing up on the bank and bodies, guess what that's going to do to Butch? <laughs> He's no longer taking it by my word. It's now by sight. But we know that the just shall live by faith. Now watch this. So God showed them in verse 30, right? Then what does verse 31 say? So here's what happened. They were fearing Pharaoh and his army until God showed them. And now they fear the Lord. Y'all see the application? I didn't have to go to a book and I didn't have to make, I, I didn't have to come up with it. Why? Because the flow of the text brings the application. Does that make sense? Now, if I'm reading a gospel, or if I'm reading something out of the epistles, or I'm reading uh, a narrative out of the Old Testament, there is a little different thought process that you have to go into, okay, uh, as you're studying because it's written different. If you're studying Proverbs, man, Proverbs, you, you have a one, one verse and bam, the next thing is something totally different, is it not? Right? And so I want you to understand that you've got to understand what you're reading, okay? Paul's writing a letter to the church at Corinth. Or Paul's writing a letter to the church at Galatia or Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees that Brother Mike was talking about, right? I mean, he, he did an unbelievable job as an introduction. What did he do? He backed up and said, hey, uh, the, the uh, can you help me out? The, the Herodians, the Herodians come first, and then the Sadducees came, and then the scribes come. Y'all remember this message? Why is that important? Because the Spirit of God wrote it and put it in order so that you and I can go, hey, they did this, they did this, they did this, and they sent this one man to ask this one question about this one commandment. Is that not what he said last night? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Now, you've heard me say this, um, and I'm not here to give you an English lesson, but you need to, you need to look at prepositions. You've got to look at verbs. You need to look at all the stuff that's listed in that, in that sentence, in that paragraph. Okay, you got to know what the whole book's about. you got to know what the whole Bible's about. And you go, Brother Brad, I don't know what the whole Bible is. Well, we don't either. But here's what I do know. That when I'm studying the book of Numbers in staff meeting, y'all want me to give another illustration? When we, we were, when we were studying uh, when um, the, uh, y'all help me out, dude that touched the heart and killed him. Ugly. When he, not Dan Ugly, but when, when, he, when he touched the ark, you remember the the oxen? They had it on the on the thing, and it stumbled, and he touched it. You go well. You know he was trying to stabilize this. You know what the problem is? If you really study all the way back, what happened was is David let them carry it at, like the Philistines was carrying. It. God in Exodus gave them poles to put it on the shoulders of the priests, gave it to the certain people to carry the ark, 
And now Israel's going, well, when they went back and got the ark from the Philistines, they just put it on the back of a donkey. So the issue, yes, there is an application that this old boy touched the, the holiness of God and God killed him. But you trace it all the way back and David has not given the reverence to the ark. Does that make sense? Y'all good? Yeah, now read verse 6. What's uh, verse uh, first, first Corinthians 10? Somebody read verse 6. Now, these things, you got to look at what these things are. Now, there's the application. Y'all got that? And it's just, it's right there, okay? So, let me, let me give you another one. Can we give you another one? And then we'll take a break. Everybody good? We'll go, we'll go like 10 minutes and y'all have a bathroom break. Y'all good? Take your Bible. And let's just turn to anything of an epistle of Paul. I'll let you pick it. Which is Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, Romans, or say Corinthians, you know, uh, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Philemon. Y'all pick it. Give, give me one. No, just, just Romans. I'm not, I'm not, I'm on a book. You want to just do Romans? You want to do Romans? All right, go to Romans chapter 1. Now, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to dive off into real deep, but we could sit here and we could discuss what the, the overview, the theme. Y'all have study Bibles that have subjects that's on the book of Romans of what it's all about. They're possibly the key verse, Romans 1, 16 and 17, or whatever is in your study Bible. But let's do this. I want to start in verse 1. And let's put to practice what he just did. Okay. Somebody read verse 1. Okay. Most of us would look at this and go, okay, here's the introduction or the salutation of a book. It's a whole sermon. So the first question is who? say? What's the first word? Paul. Let's deal with it. Who is he? All right, now let's go phrase by phrase. And I, I'm, I'm not going to beat a dead horse here, but we're going, I'm going to give you guys an opportunity. What's the next phrase? A bondservant of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be a bondservant of Jesus Christ? Where is it found? Exodus 21. He didn't, he didn't know I was going to do it, but y'all see this. So, so let me give you a couple of laws. I'm not going to give you all of them, but there's some laws that you need to understand. For example, the first thing you need to remember is the law of first mention. In other words, where's the first time the word bond servant is used? Where's the first time the word sin is used? Where's the first time the word trans trespass is used? Why did Paul use sin and not the word trespass or transgress? So where's the first time the word bond servant is used? I mean, first mention is a really important deal, is it not? Would you agree with that, Brother Mike? Y'all got me. So what did we just do? I just took Romans 1, and you take Romans 1, and now it can go all the way back to Exodus 21. Now what are we doing? We're teaching the whole counsel of God. We're not going to say that Paul is using something different than Something outside of the Old Testament. Does that make sense? So as you're studying the Old Testament, it ought to make you understand more about the New Testament. And as you're studying the New Testament, it ought to bring light to those difficult passages in the Old Testament. Don't discard the Old Testament. The reason most people read the Gospels is they think that it's easier just because of the way it's written 
But listen, you understand that everything the Apostle Paul or the Lord Jesus had to preach was the Old Testament. So when in Luke, when it, it says that Jesus, starting with Moses and the prophets, expounded the scriptures to those two on the road to Emmaus, what did he do? Man, he had to preach Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He had to deal with Proverbs. He had to deal with Psalms. Expound it. To dig it out. To show. To dig it up. To, to what? It is. It's expositional. Does that make sense? And so this is not a style. This is, I believe, the way Paul and Jesus and Peter and all of these guys did it. Why? Because they stood before their churches and they had to read the scrolls and they had to go, look, this is who it is. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. All right? What's the next phrase? Romans 1. Called to be an apostle. Can I help you? I don't care how many people call themselves apostles today. They're not apostles. How do I know that? Because of Acts 121. It's a qualification. They had to see. They had to walk with the and, and see the resurrected Lord had to come in and out from among that's what that's what they were does that make sense so why is it important that we study this way because there's so much garbage coming out of churches from false doctrines and heresy y'all do know what the difference between false doctrine and heresy is don't you maybe y'all need to do homework on that okay so with that being said We'll take a break. Is your wheel spinning yet? Are you seeing it? See, the truth of it is you take one verse and preach a whole sermon out of it. You take one verse and teach a whole class out of it. You take one, one verse and spend a week in it. So who's the audience? Rome. The church at Rome. What is Paul's authority? He was a slave, but he's called to be an apostle. How? Let's talk about it. How? What, what's the next phrase? To what? To the gospel. So, to is a preposition, is it not? Separated is a verb. What is he separated to? So, what is he separated from? So, why was Paul always saying, you turn to God from idols to serve. To, from, to, prepositions. Now, Joel, you, you said it. Paul was an, an idol. He, he was an uh, idolater being religious. What was his idol? His religious resume. Is that a fact? Does that make sense? Y'all see how that's, as you start studying, you can't just read, okay? You've got to understand how you're approaching the Word of God. Man, this is the Word of God. So let me show you how I read. You ready? Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Paul, a bondservant of. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. What did I just say? I read it however many times I needed to read it to emphasize each word. He's a bondservant. Jesus, the Christ. So here's the question. Is your Jesus the Christ? Most folks think that Christ is Jesus' last name. Because when they hit their hand with a hammer, that's what it looks like, right? Absolutely. He's all about bondservant. Come on. So if you look in Exodus 21 with bondservant, can I tell you, if you're doing a Sunday school lesson or a message or just for your personal time, you, you literally can spend an hour on just that word bondservant. Because when you turn to Exodus 21, here's the way it reads. 
after six years, this was the law of God, after six years, if someone served out of duty, you're to let them go free, them and their family. But if that servant comes back to the master and says, but master, I do not want to go free. I love you. And I want to serve you forever. So now what's changed? Six years it was out of duty. He didn't have a choice. Now, how's his service? Out of love, out of delight. So then they bore a hole in his ear. And everywhere that bond servant goes, they don't look at him and say, hey, there goes John. No, that boring a hole in his ear marks him as belonging to that master. But remember, it's out of delight. So when he walks down the street, they go, hey, there's Brad the bond servant. He's always identified as his master. So Paul says, I'm a bond servant. Not because I have to, but his love constrained me, captured me. And I'm always identified as mine. Stephen Oper used to say this. He said the reason that Paul was a bond servant is because his master had taken him out of bondage. You're going to be bound to one of two things. Same thing here. Either you're going to be bound to the Egyptians or you're going to be bound to the Lord. Right? Does that make sense? I've got about 100 things I could share with you, but I'm going to let you guys take a break. Here's what we're going to do. You need to go pee. You know, we're loaded. <laughs> Already. Brother, we ain't, we ain't, we've only been in here 40 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, what we're going to do at, when we get back, uh, we, I want you guys to pick a passage and um, Mike and I will just tag team. Is that good, Mike? Can we do that? Because we really haven't even discussed what we're going to do. But let you guys pick any passage and we'll walk through it together. Y'all got me? Is that good? All right, take about a five minute break. Miss Susie? The law of first mention. First mention, not dimension. First mention. When is it first mentioned? When is it brought? Okay. You can use the Nave's Topical Bible on that. You can use, um, you can use the Blue Letter Bible. Just type in Blue Letter Bible and type the word and for the whole Bible. And it'll show you, it'll come up a gazillion times how many it's used, but it'll give you when it's used the first time. And just go down. Yeah, whatever you're looking for, whatever your word you're looking for, do the whole Bible, and when you punch it, it'll come up where it's going to be used the first time. Does that make sense? No, it, it, there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. It lists it in order. If you do New Testament, it's starting Matthew or wherever it's at the first time it hits. Okay. Y'all me give you another law right quick. The law of repetitiveness. So, for example, where Jesus goes truly, truly, verily, verily. That's the Alabama term for show enough, show enough. Listen up, listen up. Huh? Does that, yeah, does that make sense? So, the law of first mention, and then the law of repetitiveness. In other words, Joshua, what does he say? Be strong and of good courage. Five times in six verses. He's driving a point. Be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. So when you see that phrase, again, if you're going phrase by phrase, you go, okay. Then I go, where do I hear that? Somewhere else. Is this the law of first mention? Is this the first time that it's been used? If not, let's see where that phrase is used. The does that make sense? And so what that does is it allows you to begin to, to get a whole Bible concept of why Maybe Paul or Jesus or somebody in the New Testament used that, that phrase. Y'all got me? Is that good? You ready? Take a break.
do, do. All right, guys, it's 10 o'clock. So, y'all ease back in here. Let me give you an illustration of <clears throat> the work that it takes. The reason most people are not expositors is because it takes work. Okay? Now, how many of you guys would say and be honest and admit that a lot of times when you're studying, you can't find enough of information or you, you just, you know, five minutes and you've done read 14 verses. Well, you, you do this, you're going to be on a verse for hours, okay? And uh, just let the Lord, let the Word of God speak for itself, okay? Jill watches all the first 48s and the CSI and NCSIs and all that stuff. So if we was to go to a crime scene today, what would be the first thing you did? Let's go. Somebody tell me. Throw up. Okay. What else? You don't know what kind of crime it was. Yeah, why are you automatically going to a murder scene? I just said a crime scene. I didn't say. Well, it would be Jill. She'd be watching the murder scene. Okay. All right, now what are we doing? Put your gloves on, all right? You've got a perimeter off. Okay. Gets contaminated. Okay, what else? You got a document. So, guys, when you're studying, one of the greatest things you can have is a pen and a piece of paper and just start writing stuff down. What do you not want to do? Miss something. Yes, and you don't want to miss anything, right? So what are you going to do? You're going to look under everything. You're going to turn over everything. You're going to look up, down, around, uh, under. Right? Yeah, sometimes you got to have a black light, right? A different kind of light. Sometimes you got to have glasses. Yeah, so, so you got to see it from a different angle, okay? If it... it you do understand that when they take pictures, that's what they're doing. They're giving a different angle. Okay? In other words, they stand here and take a picture, and then they go here and stand and take a picture, and they, but, this, but they're looking at the same thing. It's the same thing we're talking about doing here. Okay? If we would be meticulous in a crime scene, how much more meticulous could we be and should be about the Word of God? Right? All right. So y'all pick a, pick a text. If you don't have one, me and Brother Mike have just talked about one, we'll give you. Y'all want me to give you one? Good. Brother Mike's going to come in to go to 1 Corinthians 13. <laughs> All right, so, so here's, a, here's a good, good example of, of what Brad's talking about and uh, breaking something down from a... Uh, in this case, it's really a word by word, not just phrase by phrase. Um, because a lot of times what happens is when you're, when, you're, when you're looking at a passage, and this is where it gets into the language a little bit, um, because remember there's a, there's a big gap between Greek and English, and Greek is so much bigger than the English language, and so the English only had so many words to pull from. But if you look at 1 Corinthians, okay, and I'm I just, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to teach through this, but I'm just trying to show you what, uh, what, uh, you know, how I, how I look at a passage, how I ask questions and, and how I study it. So look at verse one and, and, and two and three real quick. And that's the first paragraph. So if you're, if you're studying this, you'll study one, two, and three together. All right. Then you'll study four through seven together because that's the second part. All right, and when you start putting this together, and this really feeds off of what, uh, you know, what we were talking about last night in the message about the greatest commandment. Though I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not charity. All right, now, so I stop. I don't go anywhere else. Yes. Yes. So like, uh, if you look at verse 1, what's the first word of verse 2? Huh? What's the first word of verse 3? 
So how many agree verse 2 and 3 goes with verse 1? All right. Then verse 4, charity suffereth long. All right, now, so the, the principle of the, or the subject matter has not changed, but the direction of what he is saying concerning that subject matter has changed. Because in verse 1, 2, and 3, he's talking about the importance of charity. Okay, how it's to be preeminent. But verse 4 through 7, he's talking about the definition of charity, what it looks like. Okay? And so that's how you differentiate. Okay? So if I'm studying this, verse 1, 2, 3, then verse 4 through 7, and then beginning in verse 8, um, and, you know, in verse 8 through 13, you can do as one, but you can also break it up um, to verse 8 through 11 and then 12 and 13. But you know, and so some of this is just depending on how much you want to bite off. All right, so, so how does he know that? Because I know I've sat where you guys are sitting, and there's people explaining things to me, and I'm going, how did they get that? Okay, so verse 2 and 3, he showed you and, and, okay? All right, so go down to... Uh, Verse four through, uh, verse four through seven. What what is that? What, what do you see there? He he said it's about. He's describing it, but there's there's a particular word that you need to see in there. What is a law of repetitiveness? Love and is. Okay. What does verse eight say? Never is it repeated. Repeated again. Is it repetitive? Was and repetitive? There was and, 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 right? So how do I know that thought is continuing to go through? Because there's a repetition, re, 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 repetition, re, repetition, thank you. All right? So in those first ver verses, four through seven, love is, eight then says it does not. So what is it? That's a contrast. Now, the subject matter is still the same, Corey, but we've turned a different direction, okay? Y'all understand it? Even is is important. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is long-suffering. Love is, 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 but never. Okay? Now, your translation may not have the word but in it, but but is a turning corner verse, right? But, what does that mean? I'm going this direction, but for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Does that make sense? So I didn't want to stop your thought process. But that's how you know. you got to look at it, guys. you got to put these laws into practice. First mention, laws of repetition. Okay, and then I'll give you some more when he gets done. Okay? So, so you look at verse 1, okay? He says, I speak with, though I speak. In other words, he's speaking from a hypothetical standpoint. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. Now, I'm going to stop right there and have not charity. So here's the first thing I'm going to do. How many of your Bibles just have love instead of charity? Okay. Well, that's what it means. So now, my first question is, what kind of love? Because in the Greek, there's four versions of love. Only three are used in the New Testament. There's phileo, which means a brotherly love, a friendship love. There's eros, which is only used once. It means a love with a hook attached to it. In other words, I'm going to love you to get something in return. And then there's, what's the other one? Y'all know the other one? Agape. All right, so, so how many agree? First thing i got to find out is which love this is. Well, if you look it up, it's agape. So then my second question is, what is agape? I mean, you, you see how you're doing this? I mean, it's just not, you just don't take these things for granted. It, and so, so I say, all right, what is agape? Well, it's God's love. Well, what's God's love? All right, it's unconditional love. Okay, what's unconditional love mean? So you keep asking these questions. So in other words, it's a love that's not determined on the basis of anything else. 
That's what unconditional love means. How many agree that the Bible says you and I were enemies against God before God saved us? How many are you glad he loves you anyway? So in other words, what you or I do does not determine how much he loves or does not love us. Okay? It's, yeah, it's, it, it's unconditional in its nature. All right, so now I've got that part done. Now I go back to the first phrase and I say, though I speak of tongues of men's and angels. Now, boy, we're opening up in a can of worms. Are we not? Because if I think of speaking of tongues of men and angels, what immediately does my mind go to? Charismatic, heavenly prayer language, right? So I've got to ask myself, well, what does this mean, tongues of men and angels? Well, if you look up the word tongues, it's dialect. It doesn't mean a prayer language. In other words, here's, here's what it means. So I'm going to ask the question, what in the world does this mean? So here's what it means. It means even though I could articulate or I could orit or be an orator as gifted as the best of all men and the best of all angels. And I have not love. So are you, are you saying that you can articulate as the best of any man and the best of any angels and have not the love of God? No, I didn't say that. He said that. So, so let me ask you a question. Now watch what this does because you're going to ask and answer these questions. So, so how do we normally determine if someone is spiritual or not? By what we see, by their actions, right? Oh, they could speak so spiritual in their sound and how they articulate and they have not love I'm become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal so how many agree I'm going to stop there and say what does that mean can I just put it very simple to you just a bunch of noise in other words vanity now watch the next phrase and though I have the gift of prophecy, in other words, I can articulate not just as the best of man and as the best of any angel, but I can articulate truth. And understand all the mysteries. In other words, here's what this means. So again, I'm going to ask and answer a question. So what does it mean to understand all the mysteries? In other words, I can articulate truth in such a way that I've got all of this figured out. Now remember, he's talking in a hypothetical here. So is that possible first? No. <laughs> so why is he using a language that's impossible? Because he's trying to get a point across. Don't matter how much of the Bible you know. And it don't matter how much you can articulate. It don't matter how good you can articulate. He says, if I understand all the mysteries, in other words, I understand everything the Word of God says, and all knowledge, in other words, I, I can apply it to everything. And though I have all faith, in other words, I walk in faith so completely that I don't even know what unbelief is. I have all faith. I have the fullness of all faith. Well, positionally, by the way, you already do. But he's not talking about that. He's talking about, I, I literally, I practice perfect faith. Anybody done that in here? Okay, I didn't think so. I haven't either. <laughs> Nobody has. It's impossible. But what he's saying is, though, I, though that were possible, that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am what? I'm what? Nothing.
Oh, that's 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 right. That's exactly right, because that's the key to this whole passage. So can a, can a lost person speak in an oratorial way that is absolutely wow? Can a lost person speak about the Word of God? Yeah, to see if they don't have love, which he's right. Agape only comes by the life of the Lord Jesus. You're nothing. Now, Watch this. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Now, here's where you're going to do a little study. When you begin to look at this phrase, you're going to say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means this. Here's literally how it means. Let's say that Corey here is, is poor. He don't have any food. All right? Now, when I do this, here's what this phrase means. And I'm not meaning this literally, but figuratively, okay? It literally means this, though I take the food out of my own mouth and put it in his mouth. In other words, I give of my only substance to someone else. Now, if we saw somebody do that, what would we think? I'm not talking about literally taking it out of their mouth and putting it in somebody else's mouth. But I'm saying if you saw somebody that only had enough food for themselves and they gave it to someone that they deemed to be poor, what would you say about it? Yes. Yeah, it, it's that's a great question. Well, number one, you have to uh, three things. Number one, you have to look the words up, okay, and then you look at the phrase. Though I bestow all my goods. So what does all mean? All that I have. Does that make sense? And, and so when you put those things together, it, it begins to formulate for you. Look up the words. You know, what does bestow mean? What is, you know, in the phrase, and then you put the two together, and you come up with this interpretation.
you can take it a step further. Religion can do this, but only Christ can do this. <laughs> yes. Oh, you're good. So let me make one more statement and then we'll finish this. So if I read those first three verses and I find out that contrast between what my flesh can do and what's true of love, how many agree now I need to know in detail what love means? Why do I need to know that? Because I want to know if I'm walking in this or this. Are you with me? Because sometimes you can get deceived by your own natural. <laughs> right? So guess what? Now, I'm not going to go through this, but, but I will do this if y'all want it. And I'll make it available to Brad so I can. But if you go, you go home and you take verses 4 through 7. No, I don't want to. It would take too long. But if you take verses 4 through 7, I want you to go and Look up each of those little phrases. So, real quickly. So, charity suffereth long. What does that mean? Okay? And, and so, you, you begin to look these up. Is kind, envieth not, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. Some of these are going to be simple. You know, they're just as simple as what you read in the English. But some of them mean far more than what you're reading in the English. No, I, I don't. <laughs> but anyway, well, I, I want I want you to go walk through it, and then I'll I'll make this available to y'all if y'all want it. This is my notes on it. But uh, you look at that. All right. So let me give you one here. Uh, does not seeketh seeketh not her own. All right. So what does that mean? It simply means this, that true charity is going to separate self from others. Meaning others becomes more important than self. Seeking not our own. What does it mean? I'm not seeking what is good for me. I'm first seeking the glory of God and the good of others. And I'm third. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's that's exactly right. And so, so when you when you do that, you're you're putting self aside. You're you're dying to self. Let me give you let me give you a perfect example. A lot of people are very giving people or very helping people because it makes them feel good about themselves. 
Let me tell you the most giving people you're going to find that are not saved. The ones that carry the most guilt. Because they have so much guilt, they got to feel like I've got to justify myself. And so they become servants, they become givers, because they've got to do something to erase this gnawing of guilt. But see, sometimes even our service and giving can be seeking my own. Yeah. goes to the love is kind. Now, here, here's what you need to do if you, if you find a passage like this, okay? And there's other passages like it. So if I'm doing this in my personal Bible study, here's what I'm going to do, okay? And I'm just going to show you this, and then I'll turn this over to Brad. Charity suffereth long. I stop. I say, what does that mean? I look the words up. I find out what it's really meaning, and then I stop right there, and I say, all right, Lord, is your love so manifested in me that it's long suffering that I can be long suffering towards others or am I quick to be offended towards others because that's what it means suffering long and you stop right there and you wait to the spirit of God let you see what you need to see. And then if he shows you that this is not real in your life, you, you stop and you go, Lord, I confess this before you. See, this right here, verse 4 through 7, is one of the greatest tests you'll ever take in your life. Now, you may go through it and you say, well, I don't even have the love of God. Well, that's a good thing, too, if you're willing to see it. Right? So, I mean, you know, guys, listen, this is the way you study. You take these phrases, you break them down. I'm telling you, this is rich. Four through seven is rich. It's, it's the most convicting passage I've ever come across. Well, not ever, but one of the most. Yeah, I mean, you're going you're gonna, to, at least in the introduction, you're going to paint a picture of what is charity. Or, or, or if you've got love, what love is this? So it's agape. Well, agape can only be God. So then you can, yeah, you define it, and you may use a verse like, the love of God was shed and are brought by the Holy Ghost. So if you're saved today, this can be reality in your life. Guys, Listen to this statement. This, 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 if you don't remember anything I've said the whole time, remember this. The greatest damage that's done when it comes to teaching truth to your kids, to your grandkids, in the Sunday school class or in the pulpit, the greatest damage done is not most of the time what is said, even though there's a lot of damage done by what is said. But the greatest damage done is what's left out. So I'm going to give you one example, and then I'm going to turn this over to Brad. The word believe. Okay, so I quote the passage, whosoever believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Is that a passage in the Bible? Okay, so I just say, all right, guys, listen, if you want to be saved today, the Bible says, whosoever believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. And I stop there. I don't say anything else. Exactly. And so, so like, for instance, I just quote that verse. Okay.
So, so when you look at this, okay, so I quote that, whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved, or whosoever shall believe on him, and I leave it there, and I'm, like he said, I've not went back and looked at the context first, and then I don't deal with the word, what it means. So if I use the word believe, and I just went through this room, and I said, define believe. Now, I'm not going to do it, but I guarantee you I'll get 10 different answers. So when you're teaching your kids or your grandkids or a Sunday school class or something, and I use the word believe, then, and I don't define it for them, then I'm assuming they already know what it means. But in reality, very few people really know what it means. And so, so how many of you agree? I believe Abraham Lincoln was president. So is that what it means? Obviously. I mean, agree. Me believing Abraham Lincoln was president makes me smart, but don't make me anything else. All right, so when you look the word up, it's the word pursue. You find out it is, it is a faith that results or produces surrender. It's a faith in is the way it's going to be defined. So I am yielding myself by faith in who he is. And can I tell you, whosoever should call upon the name of the what? And by the way, that doesn't mean praying for them. So that's what I'm saying. You have to, the greatest damage is done is what's left out because people just assume, well, they, they know what it means to believe. Well, they don't. You got it? Now look in your Bible. There should be a little asterisk. There should be a, a letter. There should be something to tell you that that, quote comes out of the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2. Right? Now go to Joel 2. What, what, what did it say, Mike? Joel 2 what? Joel 2, 32. So let's go to Joel 2. Now, now why is this important, guys? No. That's a, that's a great answer. But that's not the right answer. And I appreciate you taking notes and regurgitating back to me what I told you. But it was trying, Chris. That's okay. All Paul knew was the Old Testament. So why would Paul quote Joel 2.32? What is the context of Joel 2.32? Or Joel 2. Let me back. Let, look up here. Ooh. It's the day of the Lord and what? Okay. It's a call to repentance. But listen. Who else preached out of Joel 2? Peter, when? On the day of Pentecost. That's a pretty important passage of Scripture, would you not say? That if that's what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, we might ought to know what it says. Now listen to me. What Brother Max said without saying it, and I'm just going to say it. We take verses that look good on a magnet to put on our refrigerator or even in evangelism class because it's short and condensed and rip it out of context and have no idea what that means. Do you believe people in hell are going to call on the name of the Lord? They will. Luke says they will. So is that contradicting? Does that make sense? Surrender and repentance are two, two, uh, two sides of the same coin. So why am I saying this? And because, guys, here's, when you're studying your Bible, don't just read it and go, well, for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why did Paul say that? It's in quotes. It's there for a reason. The one thing the English Bible does do, it gives us some highlights to let you go, oh, wait a minute, this is a quote. Y'all got it? Right. Right, which is the John 2, uh, 20, 21 through 24 passage. They believed in his name, but they didn't believe. So what does pastuo mean? Pastuo means a belief with the intent to obey. It's a, huh? Pastuo? P P I. It's a Greek word. I think it's P I S T E O U. Yeah. So, 
One of the things that you guys have got to understand is in American English, how were you taught to read? You started with the first word and you just left or right. Let me tell you what most of y'all do in 1 Corinthians 13. If you did it in a quiet time, you're trying to get to chapter 14. And then you're going to try to get to chapter 15. So you can say, I read chapter 13 today. But did it read you? As he just walked through it, it read you. It read your meter, didn't it, Kyle James? <laughs> didn't it, Jeff? You say, so why is this important? I don't have to set you down. I will. I can t give you some tools in the toolbox how to do a quiet time. But if, if you let it read you, because if you're not careful, what you're going to do is you're going to get excited about studying because God's going to begin to open up things for you, and then you're going to start studying for everybody else. Right, Brother Mac? I'm going to start studying for my Sunday school lesson so I can tell, tell Corey he's not, he's entitled, by the way. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And if I'm not careful, I, I'm going to get a lesson or a sermon or something for him and not even see myself in it. Amen? All right, let me give you, let me give you, uh, just one thing, and then we'll, we'll take another break, because um, I know we're throwing a ton of stuff at you guys, I know. Um, let's, let's look at a, a passage of Scripture on comparative. Paul does it often, okay? He compares some things. Uh, he's saying the same thing with a different word. So look at 1 Thessalonians 4. This great passage, the funeral passage, right, for a believer. Starting in verse 13. What's the first word of verse 13? All right, because Brother Mike kind of covered this a while ago in 1 Corinthians, right? But what, is the, what, is, what does that word tell you immediately? Go back and look, but it's also the word but means what? It's a contrast. Or we're comparing, right? In other words, it's this over here. Say it. But here's the other side of it, right? Remember, it's a corner verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, right? But what's the next word? I don't want you to be. We, 1 Corinthians 10 a while ago. We don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be ignorant. Y'all got it? So, verse 13 through 18, what is Paul dealing with? Let me give it to you. Ready? Paul's dealing with the coming of Christ for his church. Can we agree on that? That the dead in Christ is going to rise, right? The trumpet of God. Y'all with me? Now go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. find it. shouldn't have been hard. It's right there on the other side of it. Somebody read verse 7 and 8, chapter 1. Okay. So what's the difference in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 2 Thessalonians 1. What is Paul dealing with in 1 Thessalonians 1? It's coming to Christ, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. Is the subject, Mac, I'm going to. Let them off the hook. Is the subject of 4, 1 Thessalonians 4, and 2 Thessalonians 1 the same subject? Similar. 
Now, Christ is the subject, but how are they different, Brother Mac? Huh? Well, let me, let me put it to you this way. There's one coming for his church. There's one coming with his church. Okay? Y'all understand what I'm saying now. I don't, want, I don't want you to get all wigged out about this. But now doctrinally, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with eschatology. Okay? One's dealing with the rapture. Amen? And one's dealing with the return. Does that make sense? Did I communicate that well enough? Would you agree with that? Okay. Okay, so he asked the question about obedience. The, 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 the truth is, it's the same thing we're dealing with in First and Second Peter. They're, they're in persecution. They've been told, they, they're thinking Jesus is going to come, right? We're in the last days. Well, when's he going to come? Right? Well, what's happened in First Thessalonians is the Sadducees, who sad you see because they didn't believe in the resurrection, and so therefore they told everybody, you missed it. And Paul's going, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You know, the Lord's going to come for his church. And then in 2 Thessalonians, he says, let me tell you how it's going to come down. Y'all with me? And so now you're dealing doctrinally, and why is that important? Because there's a lot of Sunday school literature, there's a lot of books and devotional books that take these verses, rip them completely out of context, or some of them that have a different persuasion of eschatology, is that an easy way to say it, is going to start telling you this is what it says, for example, the Watchtower Society, the Jehovah's Witnesses, most of their stuff is um, most of their stuff is based upon the Book of Revelation. You know why? You you know why? Because they know that evangelical Christians in America very rarely read the Book of Revelation. You know why? Because you can't start in chapter one and read through, and it's chronological. And so it cuts across the way we have been taught how to read. Would you agree with that? Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a, a break, about a five-minute break. Some of you guys are easing down. And then I'm going to let Brother Mike again help you guys. Mark's got it up here for uh, Blue Letter Bible, kind of walk you through a couple things. I want to cover a couple things as well on it. Uh, and then if you guys want to stay, we'll stay. But I'm going to let you guys get out of here because I know it's been a long week. Um, Y'all good? Is that good? We were going to call. We were. We were. We were going to deal with Psalm sixty-three, but we're going to deal with First Corinthians thirteen. Okay. Y'all got it. You got to know what you're reading because you don't read a comic book like you read an encyclopedia. You don't use a reference book like you would read a biography. Y'all got it. Take a break. Take about five minutes, and we'll come right back in here. Okay.
All right, guys, let's, uh, let's kind of get this thing uh, wrapping it up here. Um, is this helping you guys at all? Now, listen to me. I know you're not going to get it all today. We got to keep going over this. You all understand? Now, you've got your notes, and you're going to have the law of first mention. You're going to have the law of uh, parallel mention. You're going to have the law of full mention. You're going to have the law of repetitive mention. And you're going to have all these laws, and then you're going to forget it when you're studying. Okay? So you, you're going to have to, we, I've talked to four or five of you guys. That we may have to do this once a, a quarter, just kind of get together and kind of walk through this. Okay? Um, okay, so with that being said, uh, Brother Mike's going to kind of walk you through Blue Letter Bible. If you don't have your uh, Blue Letter Bible out, download it on your phone. It's one of the greatest resources that's free that you can that can do a lot of this study for you. In other words, it brings it together for you. And so uh, Mark is upstairs, and hopefully you're going to be able to see it. So did you all get in on this? Okay. Change it to Romans 5.1. Okay. So let me explain some of these crazy words, because when I said what you said, and everybody talked about interlinear and lexicons and all those things, I was like, okay, what? <laughs> Don't worry about all that. Do what? That's right. It was the green board. That's right. <laughs> the lexicon. Okay. So one of the things that you need to know, and you don't have to be a Greek histor uh, Greek theologian or a Hebrew theologian, but man, God's given us this resource that you can use, and uh, you don't have to have a doctorate degree, uh, but it will help you, all right? But I want to show you, and give you an illustration, and then I'm going to let Brother Mike kind of walk you through this, and then I'm going to cover something out of the Hebrew um, that just kind of overviews. that make sense? Uh, don't get frustrated. Do not get frustrated, okay? If you need help, we'll help you, all right? But what is a microscope for? To magnify. What do you, when you look through a microscope, what is it going to do? It's going to let you see things that are very small and minute, right? It's going to bring things, it's going to magnify it, and it's there. What is a telescope used for? It's to take something that's way out there and bring it up close, is it not? Right? You look out there, and you get to see it. So what's the difference in a microscope and a telescope? Okay, one magnifies it, one brings it closer, but both of them, you got to look through it. Right? Now watch this. That's all expositional preaching is. That's all expositional studying is. Is you've got to look microscopically, and then you've got to look telescopically. You've got to look microscopically, word by word, phrase by phrase. But then you also got to look telescopically throughout the whole Bible, the whole counsel of God, so that it can take something out of Exodus 20 and bring it all the way up. Y'all got me? So if you stand at the cross and you use the telescope and you look all the way back, what's the first part of Genesis 1 1? In the beginning. Where's that phrase repeated again? John 1 1. So John uses a telescope. You got me? And so, microscopically, we're going to look at the words and we're going to look at the phrases and we're going to look at the prepositions and the verbs and all that stuff. But we've also got to look and go, okay. Why did Paul quote Joel 2? Why did Peter preach Joel 2? Is that not a great? Because if you don't do that, guys, you'll make it say whatever you want it to say. He can make it say what he wants. What do you think? I mean, that's what we've done in Baptist life on Sunday nights. Is it not? We took the literature and said, hey, read that and tell me what it means to you. I don't care what it means to Corey. Tell me what it says. So, Tim, in our Sunday school class, the man kind of always ask these questions. We'll read a thing. What does that mean? What does it say? What, have we, what has been said? What have we covered? What did Paul say in Ephesians? Right? So in your Sunday school class, as you go, you need to, you need to ask these questions as, as you discuss. Don't sit in your Sunday school class and look at your teacher. Ask the question. When they read the text or she reads the text, ask the question. What does that mean? Wh who's he writing it to? So that everybody can get in on it. Y'all got me? Is that good? 
So Brother Mike's going to use, what, Romans 5, 1, brother? You're going to deal with justification? All right. So um, I think the, how many of y'all were here when I did the How to Study the Bible class? Okay, most of you, but not all of you, okay. So if you remember, one of the things I did was show you how to do the tense, voice, and mood. And, um, and so let me just real quick recap that and show you how you can look that up on Blue Letter Bible. All right, so when, you, when you're studying the, the language, you got to understand the Greek language is not like the English language. And what I mean by that is this. In the English language, you have three tenses, past, present, future. That's it. So past means what happened before. Present, what's happening now. Future, what's going to happen. That's the English language. The Greek language is totally different. The Greek language, there's actually five tenses, okay? And they have totally different meanings. So like one of them is present tense. And present tense for the Greek is different than English. In English, it just means what's true now. In Greek, it means habitually, continual action. So like, go ye therefore, great commission. What tense do you think that's in? Present. Why do you think that? Yeah, I mean, as you go, right? So that's present tense, all right? Be ye filled with the Spirit, which means be controlled by it. So guess what? Present tense. So how often should the Spirit of God, you allow the Spirit of God to control your life? All the time, habitually. All right? So 1 John 3, he that sins knoweth not God. The word sin is present tense. So he habitually who continually sins knows not God. So that's present tense. Now, aorist tense is another tense in the Greek, and it means this, a one-time event never to be repeated. Okay? So it can be phrased this way, a snapshot event. Now, the best way I can illustrate it is this. If I stood right here with a camera and I shot you folks in this center section right here, I can never reproduce that exact shot. You say, why? Well, you're, some of you are going to be blinking different. Some of you are going to have different facial expressions. So forth and so on. There's no way to perfectly re reproduce that shot. That's what Aris tense means. It's a one-time event never to be repeated. Now, let me show you how important Aristens is, okay? So, so I want to have him go back to the main thing so I can show him how to get all the way there to where you are, if you don't mind the, the home screen. Okay. Yeah, right there. So... So if what you'll do is you'll go up into the top up there. You'll type in Romans 5, and you can type in verse 1, or you can just leave it Romans 5. Then you hit enter. It'll come up. All right, you see there's the verse, Romans 5, 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace through, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, you see that bar over on the far left that says tools. All right, this is how you're going to do your word studies. You hit that, that button, tools. And when you hit tools, it's going to say loading. <laughs> and then it's going to bring up this screen. And this is what's called the interlinear Bible, okay? It don't matter what it means, but here's what it does. So if you go down, therefore, being justified. Now, the being justified is the verb. That's where your tense and voice is going to come from, Right? All right, so now, how do I know what tense being justified is? Well, if you'll look all the way over on the right side, see where it says parsing? All right, and he's going to click on that little button. All right, now scroll down just a little bit. There you go. You see there? Go on down just a little bit more. Yeah, there. So you see tense is what? Aorist. All right, one-time event never to be repeated. All right, so let me ask you a question. When were you justified? At salvation. Can you ever be justified again? If you're justified once, can you ever be justified again? Yeah. Would you agree with that? If you're justified once, you don't ever have to be justified again. All right, so aorist tense. If you're justified once, you never have to be justified again. Well, guess what? You just destroyed the doctrine of seven denominations. You say, what are you talking about? Well, 
these denominations that say, well, if you're saved, you can lose it and get it back. Well, if I could lose it, that means I've got to be justified again. I can get it back. Well, guess what? Aris Tent says absolutely not. A one-time event never be repeated. I was teaching a seminary class to preachers, and one of the guys in the class was a pastor of the largest uh, Assembly of God church in our county. And he called me up after uh, <coughs> the class the next morning, and he said, listen, I need to take you to lunch. And I said, okay. And uh, when he signed up for the classes, I told him when he signed up, I said, now listen, I said, the doctrine that we're going to teach is not going to be the doctrine you believe in in a lot of areas. He said, I'm, I'm fine with that. And I said, okay, I just want to make you, I want you to understand that before you sign up. So he takes, the first class he takes is my class on Romans. And I'm going, oh, no, this ain't going to be good. And so I taught him, very first day of class, tense voice mood. Gave him sheets to define it all. And so we got to Romans 5, and I, and I did what I'm doing with you. And I said, all right, let's look at Romans 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, justified, aorist tense, one-time event, never to be repeated. Therefore, if you've been justified, you can never be justified again because you don't ever need to be justified again. Therefore, you can't lose it and get it back because if you can lose it and get it back, then you have to be justified again, but you can't be justified again because it's errors. So anyway, he calls me the next morning and says, I need to take you to lunch. So I'm sitting there at lunch with him at a restaurant, and he says, I need to talk to you about what you taught last night. And I, you know, my unbelief, I stuck my hand up and I said, now, Brent, listen, I told you before you sign up for these classes, there's going to be some doctrine that you don't agree with. He said, no, you, don't, you got me all wrong. I said, what is it? He said, I can't get around that. What do I do? And I said, well, you're not obligated to a denomination. You're not obligated to this school, and you're certainly not obligated to me, but you're obligated to the Word of God. Does that make sense? You say one simple tense can unravel a whole doctrine? Yes. So can I ask you a question? Is it important to look it up? All right, now. So that's a tense. So you have present tense. Now, we're going to leave that up because I'm going to show you the voice out of this same verse. But you have present tense. You have aorist tense. One time event never to be repeated. Then you have what's called perfect tense. Perfect tense is an event that happened in the past, but the effects of that event are ongoing today. Does that make sense? All right. And then there's imperfect tense, which means a, an event that happened in the past that the effects happened in the past. And then you have future tense, which is simple. All right, now, so that's the tense. But the voice is who does the action. All right, so, so look at the same one. Therefore being justified, there's the verb. So it's tense, eris. What's the voice? Passive. Now, what's passive mean? All right? There's, there's, three, there's three voices. There's active which means the subject of the verb does the action. So go ye therefore. Who is the subject of the verb? Who is it to? If you want to raise your hand, you can raise your hand. I'll raise my hand. <laughs> All right. So, so is God going to go for me? No. I have to go. That's active. Right? But notice this, therefore being justified by faith is passive. What does passive mean? It means someone operated on my behalf to cause it to be reality. In other words, it wasn't what I did, it's what somebody else did. All right, so can I ask you a question? If you're saved today, who saved you? Could you save yourself? So if you're saved today and you're justified, then who justified you? He did. So if you're saved, whose fault is it? I said, if you're saved, whose fault is it? It's his. He's the, one, he's the only one that can do it, right? That's passive. Now watch what you've just done. You've just eliminated another doctrine. Because here's what a lot of people teach. If you want to be saved, this is what you've got to do. Repeat this prayer after me. See, if that was the basis of salvation, it'd be active, not passive. Because that means there's something I'd have to do. Or it would be middle, which middle voice means this. It's active. In other words, there's a responsibility on my behalf. And it takes passive and active and puts them together. In other words, God does a work on me or in me, but I still have to respond or act according to what God's done in me. 
So in other words, if, if, if me praying a prayer is the basis of which I come to know the Lord, then it have to be middle voice. In other words, God has to do a work, yes, but I have to do something in response to that work, which is pray a prayer. Well, I got news for you. I'm going to respond by faith, but even that faith, he passively gave me. Does that make sense? So, I mean, this stuff is so important. All right. Y'all want me to unravel an old Baptist lie by doing this? Y'all like when we do Baptist lies? That's what I call them. My folks say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, turn with me real quick. I'm going to do this one really quick. Ephesians chapter 6. Okay? Ephesians 6, and he's going to bring this up on blue letter. All right, Ephesians 6, and we're going to begin in verse 11, Mark. Okay, so we're going to hit tools. All right, now, so this is the, the passage on the armor of God. Now, how many, I know, I know you folks at New Prospect, I know Brad teaches this right, but how many of you in the past, before you sat under Brad's teaching, you were always heard or always taught every morning I'm to get up and to put on the armor of God? Okay? I mean, that's, that's what I was taught all my life growing up. Well, I've got to get up and I've got to put it on. I've got to put it on. I've got to put it on. Well, here's two things. Let's go to the core truth. Who is the armor of God? All right? So who is the helmet of salvation? Who is the breastplate of righteousness? Y'all got it? I don't have to go through all of them. You got it. All right, so therefore, if you've been saved, then who do you have? All right, so if I have him and he is the armor of God, why do I need to put it on every day? Don't make sense, does it? All right, so but how do I prove that to somebody else? Well, look at the tense. Put on. He's going to scroll down. What tense is it? One-time event never to be repeated. All right, so if it's a one-time event, when did the one-time event happen? Salvation. Because I received Christ, he is the armor. So guess what? I don't have to get up every morning and put it on. Now watch the voice. Remember what I said middle voice was? He does the work. I respond to that work. All right, so guess what? The middle voice is this. He done a work. He is the armor. He placed his life within me. There's the passive component. But I, by faith, appropriate not what I don't have by putting on what I don't have, but I appropriate what I already have. So in other words, I respond to what God's already given me, which is himself, and I respond by saying, yes, Lord, you are my helmet of salvation. That's totally different than saying, Lord, Today, I just I come to you this morning, and I put on the helmet of salvation. That's putting on something you already have. But middle is, I appropriate what I already have. Middle voice, here's the way it is. How to appropriate by faith what you already have is this. Not asking God to give you, but thanking God for what he has given you. When Jesus broke the bread for the feeding of the 5,000, did he say, Lord, Father, would you please, would you please, would you please multiply this loaves and these fishes? Is that what Jesus said? What did he say? Thank you. Why did he say thank you? Because faith says thank you, unbelief says give me what I already have. See, the Lord already knew what God was going to do. So all the Lord had to do was appropriate by faith because he was man even though he never ceased to be God, but he lived as man. And so he appropriated by faith what God had already showed him. God had already showed him what he was going to do, so therefore the Lord said thank you. So guess what? How do I put on the armor of God? Thank you. Now if you go down through, and I, if you go down through all of these verses of the armor of God, you're going to find out all of them are the same. Harris Middle. Okay. So like when, if I go down, we're, we won't look these up, but if, oh, yeah, ooh. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, mood is, there's imperative and indicative. Imperative means command, indicative means a statement of fact. is a command. Yeah. So indicative is a settled fact. It's a done deal. Huh? Indicative, yeah. An imperative. So like when you have go ye therefore, present active, okay? Habitually, go as you go, I go. Is it indicative, meaning a statement of fact, or is it imperative a command? It's imperative. He didn't say, well, would you do this? Would you think about going? <laughs> I mean, he, it's a command. Be ye filled, present active, imperative. Five two or Ephesians. Left side over there. I didn't even know what it meant. I use word search. I don't use blue letter. <laughs> well, I do too. But because I've had some of you guys ask the question, so what does it mean? Well, it's, sometimes it's an inflection, but usually it happens around prepositions. Okay? So what is a preposition? In, on, under, with, right? So when you look at that word, it's a relative pronoun. And I'm not here to make an English or, or Greek. Get out of that, Mark. Uh, go, go to the preposition of where in. Click over on preposition. All right. So, in other words, for, for layman's terms, you have to have all of those pieces together for it to make sense. For example, there's, there's words in the Greek that are combination words. In other words, you're going to find that it has a root word. Okay. For, like, for example, the word baptism. You got baptizo, baptiz, baptisma, okay, baptismas, but it's only one word. But there's a root word. And so a lot of times what the Blue Letter Bible will do is it gives you prepositions or what we would call filler words. For example, in the English, a lot of times it's written in italics for clarification. So if you're reading in your Bible and the word is in italics, it's, it's not in the Greek, but it's there for clarification. So therefore there was no English word to explain the compound word for what that is. Would you agree with that? Does that make sense? So, so for example, get out of that mark so I can show them. So where do we stand without looking at, clicking on anything? How do we stand? Go up. In. In what? Go ahead. Grace. Y'all see how that works? That's fine. Need that. They, did, they had to explain it. It happens all the time. Don't worry about it. It happens to everybody. Every time we do this, Strong's word G78. Okay. So, why is that important? Now, you guys remember when I was preaching through a mark, I dealt with prepositions a lot because it's pre positions. A lot of times your prepositions point back to. Pre 
of the position of where you're at. So where are we standing in? Grace. Now, who is grace? How am I justified? By grace, by Christ. So where am I standing? In Christ. So that is a position. That is a pre-position. In other words, my position before the Lord today is I'm as holy as I'll ever be. Right? But now my practice is I've got to live out to what I already am. How do I do that? It's the life of Christ. As it's an imperative that I do what? I appropriate who he is. Y'all got it? Man, the Lord didn't ask you to do something you couldn't do. He knew, he knew you couldn't do it, so therefore he gave you his life so that you could understand that it's him, not you. Okay? That doesn't mean passive that you don't do anything. It's a lot of the time it's a middle voice that what he acts upon me, I do what? I obey. Does that make sense? Y'all good? Why is it important? Because if you get into theological worlds and you start reading all kinds of different books, you're going to find stuff that people are going to go, man, they don't like to use the word receive because they think it's a work. Do they not? They'll say, well, you, you, okay. So now we're back to Colossians, right? How you, they don't like the word repentance. So how, how do we like, how did we receive Christ? We also do what? Walk in him. Okay, now let's go to the Old Testament. Y'all got any questions on that? I know y'all's heads are spinning because we have given you <laughs> weeks worth of stuff, but I wanted to try to hit as much as we could. What do you got, brother? Okay, I'm, Kyle asked what definition. That's a great question. I'm going to use a, I'm going to go to the Old Testament first because the Old Testament's a little harder. And then, Mac, if you want to, if you want to, it's context, but I'll, I'll, let me show you Old Testament so it'll kind of help you. Just pick any Old Testament, whatever. I don't care. Any passage. Just go to something in the blue letter. Uh, go Exodus 14. That's the Red Sea. We've been talking about that. Go ahead, Wesley. Uh, Exodus. Check one, two. How about that? All right. So, see, so there's some markers that tell you that your battery is dead, right? So we need to find the markers of how we investigate the Word of God. All right. So uh, just go to Mark. Go go to uh, no. Go go up to Exodus fourteen one. All right. So just hit tools. I've done this often. It's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Right. That that means something. So go to the to the Lord. Let's hit on that. Now, come down. Now it tells you it's a noun. It's a proper name. Y'all got that? See how all that works? Let me click out of that. Now hit hit H. Uh, I'm H three oh six eight right here. All right. Can I go up here? All right. So this one is an easy one. It just tells you Yahweh. It's Jehovah. I mean, it's pretty pretty self-explanatory, right? All right. All right. Mark, go back to the interlinear. All right, go down a little bit. All right, whoa, 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 go back up. I'm sorry. So y'all see the arrow on that? Who did the speaking? The Lord. Where's the arrow pointing to? The Lord. So that's going to kind of give you the structure of the sentence without going into more detail linguistically. All right, go go down a little bit, Mark. Uh, all right, go, go to four, verse 2. It's going to be better in verse 2. Yeah, hit the tools. All right, go to uh, speak. Go, go over to Parsons. All right, come on down. All right, stop right there. Better yet, back out of that. Go go to the Hebrew, the, the definition. All right, go to speak right there. H 1696. I want to show you why I'm doing it this way. All right, go down. So which one of these definitions are we going to use? Y'all got it? I mean, it's a, it's a A, B, C with two under that and a D and an E and an F. That'll bless your heart. Now, here's what most people will do. Most people go, well, that thing's translated to speak. That thing could be translated to speak to one another. 
It could be to be spoken. It could be to, to be speaking or to lead away to put in the flight. Well, let me explain how you do it. Go back to the interlinear. We good so far? All right, go down to, to speak right there. Just hang on. I'm going to show you. Go over to the, oh, go over. All right, go down. See the word stem? Y'all see that word P-I-E-L? All right, click on that. Just give them a little quick definition of what that is. Go back up. Go, go up a little bit, Mark. It's a what? It's an imperative. It's a command. Imperative is a what? Command. All right, now go down. It says express simple, intensive, result, resultative, causative, and other verbal action. In other words, there's going to be a call. There's going to be, it's not just speaking to give you information. What is he doing? He's speaking to cause a reaction. Now, what is the stem? P-I-E-L. Mark, go back to the, over here, click out of the parson. Go to the definition. Go down. What definition do I use? C. The P-I-E-L. It's really simple. Now, Hebrew is more difficult than Greek, but that really helps, helps the fire out of you. Okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so y'all see that? To speak, declare, converse, command, promise. So why would it be a command? Because it's in the imperative. But it also may be translated later on in a text where it says, command the children of Israel, or I command you. So that's the reason I said the Knave's topical Bible sometimes can confuse you. So let's talk about it. So we know that it's the stem in the Hebrew is P-I-E-L. Where did we get that from? From the parson, right? So it means to speak or to promise. All right? So it would be to speak a command. Now watch this. How do I know that that's the definition? How do I know it means to speak with a command because it's in the imperative? How do I know it's not to promise? The context. You, does that make sense? Now watch this. Should the promise cause a reaction? It should. The promise should give us hope. The, the promise should, we'll work till Jesus come. We'll work right now. The promise should do something on the inside of us because, listen, when you deal through First and Second Peter, he's constantly dealing with it. Now, you've got to understand, this is how the Jews thought. This is not how we think, but this is how the Jews thought. Command them and cause a response. That has a lot of weight, does it not? Because I'm telling you what most people teach in this right here. Go back to Exodus 14. Here's how most children's teachers teach it. Now listen, Moses got up and he gave them information about what God's going to do. No, he didn't. Was he giving information was he just giving instruction? No. Here's what he's saying. I'm going to take this rod, I'm going to stick it in that water, and we're going to go across. I don't know how it's all going to happen. Now it's an exercise by faith. Is it the rod of God? Is it the word of God? Anyway, there's so many applications of it. Does that make sense? Does that not change just that one word? By knowing the definition from the context. Now, who has an NIV here? Got NIV. What's the first word, brother? On Exodus fourteen one. Anybody got an ESV? Jill, you got your ESV. Matt, you got ESV. I mean, huh? Look at look at look it up. So I'm going to show you guys. Here's where some of the translations come into fruition. What they do is they'll try to define that word to try to better explain it. I'm not a, I'm not opposed. I study a lot of different translations. As a matter of fact, my word search on my parallel Bible, I've got seven of them where I can read them, each verse. 
Okay. So who's got the brothers and find Exodus 14 1? What's the first word? Then. Okay. What's the next word? The then the Lord. What? Said. What? Go go up a little bit, Mark. Is that what you're saying? Well, just go up. All right. So the NIV says said. The is that NSV? Did it say said or spoke? It says spoke. ESV said. So I'll ask you a question. Did he say it or did he speak? Let me help you. He commanded it. Well, Brother Brad, what difference does it make if he said it said or speak? It doesn't matter. I don't care what your translation say. It's a command. So when I'm preaching, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start with the command. You go, well, what's the command? We'll deal with that later. But what is the intent of what we're dealing with? It's a command. How did I get that? I looked at the stem. It means to speak. It's in the imperative. It's a command. Y'all, does that make sense, guys? Now, Mark, go back to the thing again. Because there's an arrow here. Come down. Or maybe up. Go up. I'm sorry. Come up. Yeah, it is right there. Y'all see the two arrows? And spake. What's the two arrows doing? Is and the and speak the main topic? No, both of them point to what? The Lord. So it's the command. Who's doing the commanding? Now we can go into what did he command? Y'all got me? So if you learn how to use this tool, it'll cut your study time down because you can look at it and go, okay, here's where it's going, these combo words, it's pointing, because what that really literally means is that one word in that phrase, the Lord, has to have some explanation from us from an English standpoint to understand that. Go Exodus 14, 2. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. You want to talk about they turn? All right. So let's go to, to they turn. Now that, that, they, that they turn. Now that's a phrase. Okay. So go down, Mark. So what's our stem? It's in the qual. Okay. It's in the, it's, but now it's in the uh, juicive, and uh, let's, let's, so you know what, you know what you're looking for. You're looking for the qual definition, right? All right, so let's go to, over to the, yeah. So go down. Now look at this. Look at how many <laughs> are in the qual. All right, so y'all know that fig is not something that grows on the trees. That's figurative of speech. In other words, it's using figurative language. All right? Now, so let's just look at these definitions. So the, the main one says to return or to turn back. All right? To turn back, to return, come or, or go back, to return unto, go back, come back, of dying, of human relations, of spiritual relations, of in, in, inanimate things, in repetition. Okay, so how do I determine what definition A, B, C, D, E, or F am I going to use? Context. Where do you find the context? You're going to have to read the whole thing. So what is he asking them to return to? What is he asking them to look to? What is he asking them to do? Yeah, does that make sense? Look at me, guys, and it takes time. There is no Bible for dummies. There is no cliff note version. There is no, hey, I'm going to spend five minutes with the Lord and be a theologian. It takes time. So, with that being said, 
Let me walk you through a couple of things that you need to learn to do. I tell this to pastors all the time, especially when we do pastor's conferences. Brother Mac knows what I'm talking about. If it takes me 30 hours to do one message, in other words, if it takes me 30 hours of study to do a message from Sunday morning, it takes me 30 hours to do a message from Sunday night, it takes me 30 hours to do a message on Wednesday night. Do the math. That's 90 hours. You go, Brother Red, how do you do that? You better learn to get ahead. I, I can't sit down and study 90 hours a week because my mind is not going to retain all of that. Amen? Some of y'all are all zonked out already, and we've only been here two hours, right? So what do I do? I need to know where I'm going. Most of my sermons come out of my quiet time. So when somebody comes and says, where are you going next? It's whatever book I've just read. Why? Because the Lord's doing a work in my life so that i got to understand and a kind of an insight to what I'm doing so that when I get ready to prepare a sermon, I'm not digging the well. I'm just drawing water out of the well. So what do I do? I study 10 minutes here. I go to a hospital visit. I get on my, on my, on my blue letter Bible. Does that make sense? And then my family goes, well, you're always on the phone. What am I doing? I'm always, because I'm thinking about that word. How do, I, how do I translate that word? What is, what is the definition? So you get five minutes here, ten minutes there, two hours here, four hours there, whatever the case may be, and you file it away so that when it comes time, I now, because people's going to die, there's life happens, there's going to be tragedies, and what do I do? I now have this whole compilation of stuff that I can go, okay, let me put it together. Let me give you an example. And then I'm done. And I'll let you guys ask any questions. Because me and Brother Matt can stay here all day and do this, I promise you. <laughs> Until Jesus comes, amen. I'm going to ask the ladies in here because I know how my wife is. What is more nerve-wracking? You've got company coming over. You've promised to fix a meal. And you have nothing in the refrigerator. And it's the day they're coming. Or you've invited company to come. The refrigerator has all the ingredients and everything that you're going to do. And all you got to do is go put the ingredients together and make the meal. What's more nerve-wracking? Talk to me. Not having it. Either way, company's coming. Amen? Isn't it a whole lot better when you know what you got in the refrigerator, what you got in the pantry? It stinks to start trying to make brownies, and it says you got to have two eggs, and you open the refrigerator, and you ain't got an egg. That's right. Then you send your husband, right? I love it. I love it. Is that not true? So Sunday school teachers, okay, listen to me. You hear me talk about Saturday night specials all the time. Guys, go grocery shopping three weeks ahead. It's not rocket science. Where are we going? We're going to whatever's next in the text. Read it. Read through chapter 5. Read through chapter 6. Read through whatever we're at. Does that make sense? We're in chapter 4. Read those other verses. Why? Because what God's going to do is he's going to drop a truth in what is the next thing that you can draw from even this week. Because you know where you're going. If you're going to tell me how to get to Nashville, okay, let's do this. I'm not going to pick on Jillian because she's not been here long enough. Okay, let's, uh, uh, uh. Corey, you and Tim tell me how to get to Nashville. From right here, if we're going to go to Nashville, we're going to take a we're going to take a field trip. Okay. 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 Tim, give me some instructions on how to get to Nashville. All right. So here's what he said. Let me tell you what he said. He said, you're going to take a left out of the parking lot, and you're going to go to the second red line and make a right, and then you're just going to keep going until. Tim says, I'm going to go to Pulaski and go north. Jillian? 
Does that give you, no, no, does that give you any, any instructions on how to get to Nashville? Someone that come from the West Coast has no idea what they just said. I understand. Amen. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that has a has a go-kart chain to a dog. Okay. Now, that's the easy thing. Just put it in your phone, right? So here's what we've done. That's how we study. That's literally how we study. Why did I do that? Because Tim's got a different way of getting into Nashville. Ultimately, it may take him longer, but we'll get to Nashville. What are we trying to do? We're trying to get you guys to understand how to make the stops. Amen? Amen. Is that what I'm really saying is this. Nobody asked me what we were going in. Nobody asked me the right questions. Are we walking? Are we driving? Are we riding a bicycle? Are we flying? I hear, me and you ain't walking. No, I hear you. I hear you. Amen. There are some that's that's uh, uh, indicative. Uh, all right. So, y'all have any uh, questions? Context. Mood, voice, and temps. Yeah, you got you got to completely go off of context in, in the Greek. And again, you use those rules. I didn't mean to cut you off, but you use those rules. And you go, okay, when is this used? How is it used? First mention, parallel. I've got two others, but I'm, I will wait till the next time we'll give it to you. What were you going to say? Word search, it's a computer program. And now it's Logos. I, we don't like Logos just because it gives you too much stuff. You have to spit the bones out. True. It gives you newspaper articles, and I'm like, it's real expensive. Okay. Let me make this one statement. After I'm asked a question, has this helped you guys? Um, and again, listen, you're not going to get it overnight. You're just going to keep doing it. I'm, I promise you. Um, so here, here's the question. How do you balance studying for a quiet time or studying for a lesson? Yes. Let me explain to you what I mean. If the Lord deals with me and with something in my quiet time, don't you think he's going to deal with Greg Morris with it? Now, if I'm doing a quiet time so that I can nail his high to the wall, I'm out of balance. Y'all got me? Dr. Oford would always say this, you can't master a text until the text has mastered you. You can't live out the text until you live with the text. Amen. Now, all of this stuff, okay, y'all going to start doing little bits and pieces, and you'll get frustrated and go, well, forget it. I'm not a preacher. You don't, you're not supposed to be a preacher. The Bible says study to show yourself approved. Approved to who? Not to me, but to the Lord. You're not going to be able to stand and go, Lord, I didn't know. I just, I just misunderstood. Well, you got the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Why did you misunderstand? Well, I ain't what I've been taught my whole life. Well, maybe what you've been taught hadn't been completely true. Does that make sense? So back to this. There can make, you can make a lot of true statements and it still not be true. You hear me? 
You can even pull text out of the Word of God, and it be true. But it not be true. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a true statement. It's in the Bible. But until it's in the context, it's not truth. It doesn't change the lives of people. Does that make sense? All right, any questions? You got two, two minutes. Yes. Great question. Okay, I, I'm going to make a statement. Then let she said, "Where's, where's going to be the basis to like start teaching third grade?" One of the things that, that I think you need to do is because the younger they are, kind of the more broader you have to do. Possibly keywords. Would would you say that? Have you got a keyword study Bible? You don't even know what that is, do you? That's a Bible that has keyword. It's called a keyword study Bible, and it underlines kind of keywords of the verse. And you just kind of pull those words out and kind of give clarity and definition of that. And my elder here has got something to say. Well, an example of that would be the, the one we looked at, Romans 5.1. So if I was dealing with a third grader, I would just first deal with what does it mean to be justified? And, and, and of course, I'm not going to say, all right, it's heiress tense. But I'm going to say, all right, when were you justified? You know, just simple things like that. It just, at least it'll get them to start thinking from the standpoint of asking questions. And I think, I think we need to be clear on justification. And you don't have to say, well, it's in the air stance or the middle voice or whatever. You just say, you know what that means? That means that once done, never to be done again. So it's not going to take it at face value. You and I are the ones got to have the definitions. We're the ones got to go, well, I don't know about all that. <laughs> okay. So it, it's just... Again, I think it's telescopic. I think you got to go, um, Jeanette, I think you got to go t more of a telescopic view before you do the microscopic view. You with me? Just something out there and kind of start bringing it closer to them. Yeah. Now let, let me encourage you. 99% of the places I go preach other than Max, it's like preaching to kindergartners. They've never heard the Christ life message. And most of them don't even know the books of the Bible. They're just 50 years old in kindergarten class. Is that a fact? I mean, he, he'll tell you, there's preachers all the time that come to him and go, dude, I, ain't, I don't know how to study. So, I don't know if that, I mean, it's a great question. So, you got to know your audience. You do. You, when you, you start teaching, you got to know what you're teaching and what they know. I mean, Paul did. Paul knew if they were god fears or Gentiles, or Jews. So he had to deal with his lingo based upon his audience. Okay? Any other questions? Oh, we're going to Jeanette's house to eat tonight, or today. So what you got for lunch there, sister? Leftover chicken and rice from the week, right? What you got, Judd? Here's a question, guys. Oh, okay, good. Yes. So Judd asked about the title of the theme. When did Mac tell you his title at the end? He didn't come up with the title. The text came up with the title. Because if you come up with the title before you do your lesson, you're going to make whatever you say tie together with that title. So the title's got to come out of the text, not you go, hey, I think it's privileged to privileged but not Pleasing, is it what you said? I was going to say privilege to p perishing. <laughs> uh, and so you, you've got to let that, you got to let the flow of the text determine all of that. The flow of the text has got to determine definitions. The flow of the text or the context of the text has got to come up with the, with the title, the theme, thought, or whatever word you want to use there. Is that a good explanation? Okay, what else, guys? There are, but we'll wait. I've got you overloaded right now. Because the next three laws are <laughs> tied to the other ones. All right. Any questions? Let me give you some cautions. Okay. We 
when you hear a preacher start in the middle of a text, be very cautious about what they're going to say. If they do not do a good job on the introduction of introducing why they're starting there, it's not going to be expositional. Why? Talk to me. Why? Yeah, the, you, you don't have a clue why he said what he said. That's right. If there's a but, if there's an and, if there's a whatever. All right. Have y'all got time for one thing that Mac finally confessed and repented over? Do y'all have just like five minutes? Huh? Talking about the what? The what? No. Can I show you the importance? Because I asked Brother Mac to study this. It took him three and a half years to finally call me back and say, you were right. Huh? You want to look at it? Then we'll leave. Luke. Go to Luke. Go to Luke 21. Yeah, kiss, kiss the ring. Bow the knee, son. Bow the knee. No. Listen, guys, we bounce stuff off of each other all the time. As a matter of fact, and I'm not, I want you all to hear me. What Brother Mac preached last night with those four things, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your strength. He called me and said, Brother, do you think this fits? Did you not? You remember, Jill, I was on the couch drinking coffee sitting with you when he called me. I think it was a Thursday that you called me. Before he preached it. Now, not because I know it all, but he just needed to be a sounding board. Okay? So Luke 21, let's read verse 1 through 4. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasure, and he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, Truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all, for all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood she had. How many of you guys have ever heard this? text and the title of the sermon is little little as much when God's in it how many of y'all have ever heard this text preached that this has to do with offering and sacrifices and how Jesus has commended this lady because she gave all of her livelihood and then you got to give all that you have you know you got to take out of your own mouth brother Mike and give it to the others how many of y'all ever heard that when you read that text is that not what comes to mind well, can I tell you the context of the passage the context of the passage starts really in verse 35 of chapter 20 but I want to pick up in verse 45 of chapter 20. Verse 45 says, Then in the hearing of all the people, he said to the disciples, Beware of the scribes and Pharisees who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, and the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who do what? Devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayers. These will receive what? And looking up. He does a show and tell. Well, lo and behold, here comes a widow right now. She's literally being devoured by the Pharisees. He's not commending her. He's giving an illustration of the condemnation not only of the widow, but of the Pharisees. Because what, the, what do they do? They love to devour widows' houses. They love to walk around in long robes. And looking up, what happened? Jesus is literally teaching them to beware the Pharisees. And in the midst of him preaching, here comes a woman walking up to the treasure and, and looking up. In other words, he's looking right here. He's talking to his disciples. Beware the Pharisees. And he looks, and here comes a woman. And looking up, what's and therefore? It's a connection. It's a connecting to what? What is going on? So what is the setting? Jesus is in the temple teaching. He's talking about the, the, the leaven of the Pharisees and the wickedness of who they are. And looking up, he gives them a show and tell. Well, guys, just look right here. That changes the whole context of that passage. Because there is no commendation. It is condemnation. Why? Because they're devouring that woman. Y'all got it? It's important how you study the Bible. 
And that's even on a chapter break. Yes. And so I better look back. Yes. Because here's what devotionals do. You'll read the devotional and you'll just pick up chapter 21, verse 1. And you'll make it say whatever. You'll make a title out of it. You just keep going. And, 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 and. If you're going back, it's the same way as how far do you go down before the thought changes. It's, it's still interlinked. It's like those arrows on that blue of the Bible. And the historical, yeah, and there's a lot of different things that we've kind of left out, but y'all y'all got enough to eat off the bone. Okay? Does that make sense, guys? Now, here's what gets con- convoluted is when, especially with the Gospels, it's because they cover the same storyline in a different way. And Luke may use the word and, but Mark may have a different whole scene and scenario. Make it a different thought. Make it a complete thought. So be very careful when you're reading a parable. Okay? Be very careful because those were for those folks that were sitting there. Now, there's an application for us, but be very careful. The Bible was written for you. Amen? But not everything is to you. He was talking to the Pharisees. And now I can use that for me. (laughs) Synoptic Gospels. Do you want to hang around? Because that question can't be answered in like a minute. If you need to go, let me pray. Y'all can leave. If you need to hang around, I want to answer the question on the parable. I'm going to let Mac answer some of it too. And then we'll go eat. Is that good, Mac? You hungry? We'll go to the bathroom. Everybody, ladies and gentlemen, do you need to clean up? Do I need to pray and let you let them go <laughs> so nobody sees it? <laughs> Let's pray and y'all guys get out of here. If you want to hang around for maybe 15 or 20 more minutes, we'll walk through how to maybe study a parable. Okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are.